In the alternate version of 8-6, we're going to take our same Ramirez company example, but this time we're going to record depreciation using an accelerated method called the double declining method. So how do we do our calculations? Well, we'll start out somewhat similar to our straight line and first figure out what would the straight line rate have been. You know, if we're recording the same amount of depreciation each year over 10 years, what would that rate have been? So 100% of depreciation divided by the life of the asset in years divided by 10 years equals the straight line rate would have been 10%. So every year we would have recorded 10% of depreciation in each of the 10 years if we use straight line. But this is called double declining. So that tends to tell us that we need to double or multiply the straight line rate of 10% times two in order to get the double declining rate of 20%. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, we've also got the declining balance part of it. Once we figure out the double part of it, the 20% or two times the straight line rate, to figure out annual depreciation, we take that rate times the beginning book value. That's where we get the declining part, because keep in mind, cost minus accumulated depreciation equals book value. The more depreciation we record year by year, the lower the book value is going to come. So we're taking the 20% times a declining amount over time, which is the beginning book value. So let's go ahead and work through our calculations. Beginning of year one, our book value is just going to equal our cost because we haven't recorded any we haven't recorded any depreciation yet. So beginning book value is going to be 85,600. Keep in mind, we say we multiply it times the depreciation rate of 20%. 85,600 times 20% equals depreciation expense of $17,120 for year one. We debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. The book value at the end of the year is 85,600 minus 17,120 equals end of year one book value of $68,480. Starting out year two, our beginning balance, the same of our ending balance for year one of 68,480 times our same depreciation rate of 20%. In this one, the depreciation rate stays the same, even though the annual depreciation changes. So 20% times 68,480 equals an annual depreciation amount of 13,696. And that's what we were asking this question is, what is second year depreciation? It's 13,696. If we subtract 13,696 from the beginning book value of 68,480, we get end of year two book value of 54,784. I can continue to proceed through year three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can work through these on your own, prove it out. Again, do you see that I'm taking that same double rate of 20%, twice the straight line rate, 20%, times a declining amount, a beginning book value, and what I'm getting is a declining annual depreciation expense each year. Okay, total, total accumulated depreciation is building over time, but the amount recorded each individual year at depreciation expense is lowering over time. I get to year nine, and beginning of year book value is 14361 But think about this. I've got a problem. Salvage value is 12100 My book value is getting awful close to that 12100 if I take 14,361 and I multiply that times 20%, that equals 11,489. Now I'm not going to work out the math, but I think you can figure out that if I take 14,361 and record depreciation expense of 11,489, that brings me to an end of year book value way below 12,100, way below that. So what I end up having to do is, what's the maximum amount I'm allowed in depreciation expense in year nine that takes the beginning of year book value and 
brings it exactly equal to the salvage value. So I take 14,361, subtract 12,100. I'm going to force my depreciation expense in year nine to be 2,261. Again, calculations would have shown 11,489, but that would have brought book value down below salvage value. We can't have our book value lower than our salvage value. So we're forcing that amount in. It's a really important thing with double declining is when you get later in the life, you really need to test out where your book value is. And at a certain point, you're going to have to plug a number in your annual depreciation towards the end. Year 10, we're already at a beginning book value equal to salvage value. So we can't record any depreciation in year 10 and our book value is going to remain at 12,100. Some points that I want to make is total depreciation over the life of the asset. Our total accumulated depreciation is going to be 73,500. If you remember back to our couple prior examples, that equals depreciable cost of cost of 85,600 minus salvage value of 12,100. That's the maximum amount of depreciation that we can take. All three different depreciation methods, straight line units of production and double declining are going to produce the same exact total depreciation over the life of the asset. It's just how they spread it amongst the years is going to be different, but the total amount is going to be the same. Another point is we're always going to start with the same cost basis of 85,600. The other point is that we're going to end with our same salvage value of 12,100. That's what our book value is going to be. So all three methods are going to start at the same point with the same cost. And all three methods are going to end at the end of the useful life with a book value equal to salvage value. They're all three going to record the same amount of total depreciation expense. It's just how they divvy it up from year to year is going to be different. In particular, um, if, if we look through here, our double declining has much higher, typically much higher amounts of depreciation expense early in the life of the asset, especially compared to straight line. Um, the logic for this and those that like to use double declining is some see for certain assets that they get the most benefit out of the asset early in its life. So they feel like if they get the most benefit out of it and it's helping them earn the most revenue, then it makes sense early in the life to also record the most expense. So they, they kind of feel like it does a little bit better in terms of the matching principle. Another point that I want to make, some that argue that this is a really good method, say, well, early when you buy an asset, you don't have to do a lot of repairs and maintenance. That, that seems to make sense. I mean, think about in your own life, your own personal vehicle. You get a new car and drive it off the lot. There's a lot less that you have to do, just oil changes, rotating tires, you know, very simple things. Um, that cost is pretty low. But when you get later in the life of the asset, just like this piece of machinery, just like your vehicle, more stuff starts going wrong, right? You may have to replace tires, transmission, do an overhaul in certain areas as it gets older and older, more and more wear and tear. So some tend to argue that like this and say, well, early in life, I do record a lot of depreciation expense. But on the other hand, my repairs and maintenance is really low. But then I compare it to later in the life when I'm recording very little depreciation expense. But on the other hand, I have a huge amount of repairs and maintenance. So if you add those two costs together, it sort of balances out and evens things out over the life, total life of the asset.